Welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Dr. Jennifer Hawkins and I'm thrilled to moderate this evening's cultural conversation web series with the campaign for tobacco free kids. Get your advocacy in shape initiative. This initiative aims to unite, empower, educate and really engage people of color and other targeted communities about the critical health care and human rights issues connected to tobacco use. Our goal is to inspire young community members to avoid or quit tobacco use and become advocates working to create a tobacco-free generation. How fantastic would that be? As we kick off the new year, we aim to energize and mobilize anti-tobacco stakeholders and advocates by discussing the organizing of efforts and activism crucial to the year ahead. We know that activism on and offline is more popular than ever. Young people are politically active and awakened to the inequities and systemic racism that impacts their everyday lives. My colleagues here today are not missing this opportunity to call out the tobacco industry and its history of racially discriminatory and manipulative advertising practices. Did you know that every year the tobacco industry spends 8.4 billion on marketing tobacco products in the United States. That's 23 million every single day. So today we will hear from a panel of experts and advocates about what opportunities are on the table for 2022 to fight against the tobacco industry and really how allies like yourself can engage in tobacco control advocacy work. The panel ahead of us will tackle the FDA's proposed actions to prohibit menthol cigarettes and cigars, an action on e-cigarettes, and pending showdowns against big tobacco at the state and local levels. I personally can't wait to engage in this important discussion. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I promise you, you do not want to miss a second of this conversation. And now I would like to introduce our esteemed colleagues, Alyssa Williams, a sophomore at B. Howard University and a Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids ambassador, and Gustava Torres, the Director of Youth Advocacy Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, who will lead us in a discussion on the dangers of big tobacco. Alyssa, Gustavo, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawkins. And thank you all for joining us today for today's discussion. Uh, as Dr. Hawkins said, my name is Gustavo Torres. I'm the Director of Youth Advocacy here at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. I get the pleasure of working us alongside youth and young adult advocates <clears throat> who are truly shaping and leading the health justice movement. I'm excited today to speak with Alyssa Williams, a current board member with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and our 2020 Barry Fist National Youth Advocate of the Year Award recipient. She is a fierce advocate, and I've had the privilege to work alongside Alyssa now for a large number of years, actually. Um, and she continues to inspire me with her passion and her commitment, um, not only in advancing uh, social justice movements uh, within her community, but really taking it nationally um, and ensuring young voices are truly heard. Um, so Alyssa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to work with the campaign. So, you know, kind of jumping into some of the conversation today, you know, what really inspired you to get involved in the tobacco control movement? Um, and what are some of your favorite advocacy moments? Okay, so um, when I got involved, I was about 14, 13 years old. Um, so that was like at the beginning of the e-cigarette epidemic. And really, it was just me noticing that uh, my peers, you know, we went from a generation that was like not really a fan of um, like traditional smoking to everyone had an e-cigarette. And as I learned more about it, of course, I was like, oh, like, this is definitely something I want to get into. You know, I want to be an advocate for tobacco control. I want to make sure that my peers are not using these products. And it's important that we, you know, educate ourselves and everybody else about it. So that's really why I got involved. Um, as far as like my favorite moments, I would definitely say it would have to be the symposium. Um, and only because it kind of shaped the way I wanted to continue advocacy. Um, not only being around like-minded people um, across the nation, you know, that was 
wonderful. But the symposium itself, speaking to members of Congress was very enlightening for me. And it was just very empowering. And it made me realize that that was something I wanted to continue into my adult years as well. Awesome. And for those of you who don't know, the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids usually hosts a youth advocacy advocacy symposium each summer, where we bring together young people here in Washington, D.C. Um, for a week long worth of training, um, a lot of fun skills building, um, but more importantly, um, advocating where they have an opportunity to meet with their members on Capitol Hill and really ensure that their voices are being heard. Um, and so we are excited uh, to plan this year's uh, Youth Advocacy Symposium. Um, so, you know, thinking about the fights uh, that are um, coming up um, this year, we know there's multiple fights on the federal, state and local level. Um, and more importantly, youth voices in these fights are so needed um, for a young person who doesn't really know um, or have the experience in advocacy, um, but is really interested in getting involved. Can you just um, tell us some things that they can do to get started in their advocacy journey and how they could join the fight? Of course. Um, so definitely they can always, you know, look for the campaign's resources, but if they're not really ready to get um, involved on the national level or even federally, I would say reaching out to local programs. Um, like in Florida, we have SWAT. So reaching out to the people locally that are doing, you know, the policy change, the educating in their communities um, and really starting there. And then from there, just kind of educating themselves on like, you know, what is it that they're interested in changing, um, you know, what kind of policy areas do they want to focus on and going from there and then, you know, working your way to the top. I know the first time I actually met you, you were advocating um, against Prop 94, which was a constitutional amendment in Florida um, that would have um, removed some of the tobacco control funding. Um, yes. And that was a true testament to when young people get together, um, uh, they could really create change. Will you just speak a, a little bit to that um, and that effort? Sure. Just how you got involved in that and um, how you were able to mobilize your peers in that effort. Right. So in my statewide group, um, you know, we had information about it, but we had our limits. You know, we couldn't lobby. So um, that was kind of my introduction into the campaign. It was like, I really want to, you know, make a change. I want to speak out against this, but I can't do it in my group. What can I do? And so that's how I got introduced to the campaign. And, you know, I got those resources. That really was a life changing moment for me as well. I was about 16 when that happened, I think. And um yeah, that was something completely new for me. I had never advocated at a level like that before, not in front of that many people either. Um, and it was outside of my city as well. I never, um, you know, advocated with a different group of people. I met people, um, you know, ambassadors with the campaign at that time who were older than me. Um, and the experience, not only, you know, advocating to keep the funding for these prevention programs, but also being in that room with so many people who were like so willing to listen to a youth's voice, um, you know, it was really life changing. And um, yeah, I thank the campaign so much for giving me those resources and the stepping stones just to get there. Yeah, it was such an awesome uh, moment to see the level of growth, um, but then also young people continuing to rise into their power yes. um, and make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and I think one of the things for you specifically, uh, you know, we understand tobacco is a social justice issue that really impacts racial equity, climate change, mental health, and so many other crisis issues. Can you speak a little about why young people should get involved in the tobacco um, fight to really achieve real social change? Of course. So social change is achieved through the interactions and relationships that we make with people. And as youth, it's important for us to have these conversations and keep these conversations alive with our peers um, by, you know, bringing that healthy dialogue and that education into these conversations. You know, we're getting youth and young adults thinking about the issue, um, you know, sitting there like thinking on it, um, wanting to, you know, take action in their own hands and get involved. So in order for us to really create that social change, we need to have those social conversations and create those relationships with people, you know, get in the communities because you can't bring change without the people. So it's so important for everybody and as many people as we can to get involved. Truly, I like that. You can't bring change without the people, which is really so true. Um, and kind of thinking a little bit more on this, you know, with so many important issues out there, 
um, that you know young people really care about. What strategies should we be using to elevate tobacco control advocacy as one that Gen Z should be giving their time to? Of course, definitely keeping the conversation going. You know, they always say like, you know, youth get bored of things and it is true. But by keeping the conversation alive and consistently bringing up relevant um, resources, you know, like the facts, quotes, things like that, um, even talking about policy, you know, that's going to keep the, the youth and the young adults engaged they're going to want to hear these conversations they're going to keep wondering oh so what's happening now oh i'm um, following up on this like what's going on so i think the best way that we can keep people involved is to continue the conversation that is great um you know as um you know i was super excited when you decided to go to the howard university here in washington dc um you know you chose to go to an hbcu can you little can you talk a little bit about that decision and how it fits into your journey as an advocate? Of course. Um, I definitely chose the HBCU a little biased because I did want to be close to the campaign, but um, I chose the HBCU really for the experience. Um, I talk a lot personally about like how grateful I am for my ancestors and the stepping stools that they created to get me to experience the experiences that I have now. So attending an HBCU as a young Black woman in America was really important to me, but also as an advocate, um, you know, a lot of my advocacy I've noticed, you know, Black people, Black and Brown communities are disproportionately affected by the tobacco industry and their, you know, harmful tactics. So I felt like my presence was needed at an HBCU to continue that conversation like I was talking about with my peers, you know, the young adults in the community, even the youth in the community. So. I definitely resonated strongly with bringing awareness to my HBCU and other HBCUs. So it was important for me to attend one, really. That's awesome. And, you know, speaking a little bit more of, you know, the industry and the impact of industry on black and brown communities, you know, we've seen, um, you know, the tobacco free market, uh, these, their products disproportionately to black and brown communities. Um, and you know are really making an impact on youth tobacco use. Um, so what does that look like today for young people? How are they seeing the industry in um, their everyday lives? Of course, I definitely think that um, like product placement has a big role. Any type of advertising really has a huge role to play in. Um, you know the targeting and the enticing of youth. Really, that's big tobacco's like biggest money maker is how they're advertising these products because otherwise we wouldn't hear about them um, or youth, especially um, children. They wouldn't really be interested in them if they couldn't see these colorful advertisements, um, especially how they display them in convenience stores. You know, if they were eye level to children, they wouldn't notice them. So definitely, I think um, how they're deciding to market, how they're deciding to advertise, the colors they use, the people they use in the posters, all those things factor into the fact that they're specifically targeting children and the youth. So, And it's all purposeful, right? Yes. To your point yes. of, you know, the images that they're using and the, the, the targeting um, within these ads. And one thing you touched on, um, which I'm sure all of our viewers today um, could agree, is you can't go to a bodega, a corner store, um, even a gas station without seeing tobacco advertisements just plastered on the outside. Exactly. And not alone once you get inside. Um, and, you know, as we've discussed before, this is a place where young people go um, yes. quite frequently. Yes. I know you, you've you taken some photos um, of tobacco marketing and uh, you used it for your advocacy. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So back in my hometown in Florida, um, Kissimmee slash Orlando, we definitely focused a lot on um, product placement and exactly where products were being placed um, and how close in proximity these places were to schools or like community parks, thing, you know, places you would find children. So, um, yeah, we definitely, um, you know, we had to sneak into a few of them because, you know, they weren't very accepting of photos, but we were able to um, take pictures, especially one of the ones for the campaign was um, a convenience store that's next to um, my old high school that keeps all their tobacco products, um, first of all, not behind the counter, second of all, on top of ice cream. So in order to access that ice cream, you're literally moving like tobacco products and then there's tobacco products on top of it. So it's just, it's 
it's very important to take notice and exactly where you're finding these products and what products they're next to, because I can guarantee you're not going to find the tobacco products next to the beer. You're going to find them next to the candy or the little toys that they're selling or the chips. You're not going to find them where an adult should be finding an adult product. Right. Which again, goes back to this industry who, you know, as we know, won't stop. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it is always a pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you, Alyssa, um, nice. and just continue to learn more um, and hear more about your work um, uh, is just always great. So thank you so much for sharing your time with all of us today and our viewers today who are watching. Um, so now what I'd like to do is um, share a brief video about the critical campaign that we're supporting in California as we transition into the next section of today's discussion. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, it looks like candy, smells like candy, even tastes a lot like candy, but it's not candy, it's poison. These are tobacco and e-cigarette products, chemically flavored to taste sugary and sweet with names like Pineapple Express, Gummy Drop, Sugar Cookie, Cotton Candy, Bubble Gum, and Cool Mint, all made and marketed by Big Tobacco to target kids. Because Big Tobacco knows that four out of five kids who use tobacco started with a flavored product. And once those kids get hooked, they become addicted for life. Just months ago, California passed a law to stop the sale of candy-flavored tobacco products. Now, Big Tobacco is back, spending millions to keep their products on store shelves and in the hands and lungs of children. But we can stop Big Tobacco and protect California kids by voting yes on a ballot measure this November. It will end the sale of candy-flavored tobacco products, including Minty Sweet Menthol, the original candy flavor. It's that simple. And that's why parents, doctors, health organizations, and community leaders across California agree. Voting yes will protect more kids from nicotine addiction. Yes, we'll stop Big Tobacco's candy flavor trick. Yes, we'll save lives and save taxpayer money from tobacco-related health care costs. This November, it's California versus Big Tobacco. Whose side are you on? Good evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gustavo and Alyssa. Uh, thank you for that fireside chat. That was a really impactful conversation. I'm inspired by both of you and your advocacy work in this space. Good evening again. My name is Dr. Jennifer Hawkins, and I'm the moderator for this evening's discussion. I would like to start off by introducing our panel. First up, we have Dr. Philip Gardner, the co-chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. Dr. Gardner. Next, we have Gabe Gillismeyer, the project specialist at the National LGBT Cancer Network. Good to see you, Gabe. Del Monte Jefferson, the executive director of the Center for Black Health and Equity. Thanks for joining us, Del Monte. And Deidre Sully, the senior director of health policy and community affairs at Public Health uh, Solutions. And finally, Tammy Boyd who is the policy director at Black Women's Health Initiative. Thank you for joining us. I'm so delighted to have all of you uh, to talk about this very important topic. I'd like to start off with Dr. Gardner, if you don't mind, uh, with a question that I know so many people are wondering and your work with the AATCLC. So you've been on the front lines of the movement uh, to end the, the fight and sale of menthol cigarettes for quite some time. The lawsuit brought by the AATCLC and partners spurred the FDA to make its announcement last year that they intend to prohibit menthol cigarettes and cigars. Can you share where we are in that process and what advocates can do to ensure the FDA follows through on this? 
Well, look, um, thank you, um, Jennifer, for having me on and thank the other panelists for um, being here. Um, the FDA has at least said that they're going to begin the rulemaking process, but people have to be aware this is going to be a very slow process on the part of the FDA. They have not even put the rule out yet. The rule is not, they say, will not come out until April. Once out in April, there will be comment period. And if history is any um, guide to what's going to happen, the last time a rulemaking process that was begun on menthol back in 2017, over 400,000 comments were put in by the tobacco industry to essentially slow the process down, which it did. It then went to the judge and asked for more time for comments from 60 days to 90 days to 120 days. It will then go upstairs um, from the FDA to the Office on Management and Budget where more time will be spent before it finally comes back down and a final rule is put out, which could be a year or two later. And then the tobacco industry will sue. And I say all this to say, so where we are, we're, we're not anywhere near the end. We're essentially at the beginning of the fight. I want to encourage people who are listening to this that we have to keep up the fight at the local and state level. We can't wait on the FDA. The FDA has been dragging their feet for the last 12 years or so, we, we, we have to keep a focus and make sure laws are put into place at the local and state level. That's so important, Dr. Gardner. And I think in my mind, it says how true bureaucracy can be quite, quite complicated and not mm -hmm. as easy as people think it is. And I know that from personal experience. So Tammy, I know we both speak the same language in terms of the policy space. And uh, Dr. Gardner actually shared a lot about the policy and bureaucracy at the national level and really the need to fight at the local levels to see change. Right now, there's so many issues that policymakers are focused on um, right now, particularly in this really critical time with COVID and everything else. What policy strategies do you think are needed to really elevate this issue to get rid of all flavored tobacco products once and for all? Yeah, um, and thank you for being here, Dr. Hawkins. Um, so absolutely. I mean, there's just several different strategies um, to 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 really look at. And so one of the strategies, for example, I mean, like today's conversation, really amplifying um, um, the issue and then also looking at ways and looking at other ways you can um, address the issue. So, for example, customizing messages. I think what we've learned the most from COVID is, you know, how do we customize those messages for the community, for young people, for for older people. Um, and then also just continuing to amplify the message on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, we there are several examples as well um, of, of ways to amplify the message. You can um, op-eds and just continuing to just go back over and over um, to amplify those messages. And then uh, I think most importantly, everyone loves data. You know, putting out the facts. You know, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death um, among Black women, um, you know, causing 20% of all cancer deaths. Um, really just amplifying the data and continuing to bring it in front of uh, members of Congress. That's so critical. And I really love the, the importance of storytelling and imperative to reach messages in very different venues. And I think that's really important. And Gabe, I'm going to kick it over to you because as we're talking about messaging and and hearing voices from various communities, particularly underrepresented groups, you know, you're doing so much powerful work, um, particularly creating those spaces for the LGBTQI plus community to tell their story. So you can you speak about some of the work you've been doing at the National LGBT Cancer Network and what stories are you to uplift those communities' experiences, um, and particularly with menthol cigarettes, right? So I'd love to hear more about your work, Gabe. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of it. And I feel like what Tammy was saying, data is so important. And I think for a lot of populations, we don't have enough data. And so, you know, I will fight till the day I die to, you know, have more, especially data about uh, queer people of color, especially the Black community as well, especially when it comes to uh, tobacco and nicotine products. But as far as my work with the National LGBT Cancer Network, I am part of this wonderful project called the Outbrown Free Project where we actually get to collect stories from queer folks across the country, young adults, older adults, uh, youth, about, you know, their experiences with tobacco and nicotine products. And also just, you know, folks finding out about Project Scum and other kind of marketing tactics. And I think what's so important about this is that, you know, data does tell 
one story and usually it's a, a two-dimensional story but when we add that personal story to the data it tends to add this third layer of depth to it and so i think something that really highlights that well is that we have um, one young adult who is a black trans man and he talked about you know growing up in a predominantly black neighborhood and you know his family would wait around for the newport van to come through and get their coupons and that was actually how he ended up getting into tobacco and smoking Newports. And then when he grew up and he came out as queer and trans, he went to his first Pride Festival. And you know, it's kind of in this space where he's affirming himself and seen with other people who are like him. And he talked about right outside of the gate, there was a vape company who was handing out coupons. And so once again, kind of this, the cycle repeats itself in communities that don't need these products in them. And uh, so, yeah, so I think that just adds more depth um, on these insidious practices that we see the tobacco industry employing in communities of color and then also the LGBTQ community as well. That's right, Gabe. There are people behind those numbers. And I think it's so important to really tell the stories of those people that they're not just statistics, they actually do have lives that we need to really engage ourselves in their stories. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Deidre. Um, you know, you had a blog that, you know, a great blog post where you said black people, and this is a good one, in particular, are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being assaulted, dismissed, and then discarded. I think we can all say a collective amen after that quote. Uh, can you explain more about how the tobacco industry has assaulted black communities? I mean, um, well, first, good evening. Thank you for having me um, and good evening to all the other panelists. Um, you know, really, I was where I was coming from, you know, over these last few years, you know, there's been so much happening within um, communities of color and melanated people in general, right, being assaulted, you know, from George Floyd uh, and just overall police brutality. And I think we were all and still are all um, reeling from just, you know, being assaulted, right, our bodies. And so when it comes to tobacco, tobacco industry, they've been doing it, you know, for just as long, you know, um, I wouldn't say longer, but you know, for just as long it's, and, and in a legal way. And so I think when we're, when we're talking about all of the things that um, African Americans, black people, people of color, melanated people, melanin dominant people have to go through in this country, in this world, um, at some point you have to say enough is enough. The tobacco industry has found a legal way to continuously assault black bodies and constantly get away with it. As, as we've heard, you know, just from Dr. Gardner, you know, um, you know, in, in the courtroom, you know, they are, have been given a license, you know, to kill, you know, in a legal way, um, in a legal way to do it. And I think, you know, when we're talking about that just overall assault on black bodies, we have to put our foot down, you know, this, this here, is really should be low hanging fruit. Like this is a product that if it were brand new, you know, um, when we're talking about conventional uh, products, um, if it were brand new, like cigarettes, they wouldn't be approved, you know, but yet they're still on shelves. They're still being marketed um, in pervasive ways to underserved communities, youth and people of color. And, and it just doesn't make any sense. It, it, it makes no sense that when you go to certain communities, on every block, you know, it's almost like um, what we call um, at uh, NYC Small Korea Public Health Solutions, tobacco tunnels. You have young kids in New York, you know, they did um, maps of their neighborhoods. And um, you'll come to like an intersection on every corner, there might be a convenience store, a bodega, and they all have tobacco advertising and marketing. It is definitely an assault, not just on the physical, but on the mental as well. The more ads you see, the harder it is to quit, you know, if you're a current smoker and it e it's easier for you to think that, you know, this is OK to use because it becomes something that's so normalized. And so we need to, you know, denormalize this, you know, so that's where the sick and tired of being sick and tired, like at a point, you know, stress, you know, we we're in this perpetual state of stress and, and it's not good for the body, you know, so. That's where I was coming from. You know, we have to put our foot down. I love the enough is enough attitude. And I believe in those triple effects on stress in your body and, and your action. I mean, that has taken a toll on all of us in so many different ways. 
And I really liked hearing about the mapping exercise, right, of where those those opportunities are to buy tobacco in local communities. And so I think local level action really is where it's at. I think people are noticing some of that. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Del Monte. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, big fights at the national and state level to end the sale uh, of tobacco products. But in many ways, local level action can be one of the most, if not the most, most impactful and quickest ways to stop the tobacco industry. Can you speak to the importance of really fighting at the local level a little bit for us and what change we can expect to see coming out of that space? Well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The, the tobacco industry attacks us at the local level. That's where they mostly attack us. They attack us, we've heard, we've talked about the advertising, the plastering of billboards and, and the like. We talked about the cool jazz festival, the way the tobacco industry has they, they've assaulted our communities. So therefore, the fight back has to be from the community, from the same group that's being punched and beat up, has to say, well, wait a minute, enough is enough. You're no longer going to control my thinking. You're no longer going to control my actions. I mean, I mean, speaking of that, don't forget, it's Black History Month, of course. Um, and, and Carter G. Woodson, who started um, um, Black History Month and that great educator and what he said, when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. And so these communities are saying, and they need to say enough is enough, sick and tired, you know, not uh, uh, like Van Lamy, of being sick and tired. And so we don't want you to continue to control our actions, our thinking, what it is that we're going to smoke, when we're going to smoke, how much we're going to smoke. We don't need that anymore. We want to control our own actions. We want to control our own destiny. And these communities, they have powerful assets. Our communities, they, they, they know what they want. Now, they may not have, you know, the, the wherewithal to get it done. They may not have all the resources that they need to get it done, but they know what they want. And so it's up for us to support them in what it is that they want. And so that's how we're going to get this fight done at the local level by focusing on what the community wants and their resistance not being controlled anymore by the industry. I love that. I love that. And particularly on Black History Month, it's time for us to take our voices back um, at the local level because there's some rising leaders there that we don't even know about that we want to encourage in this space. And so to that point, I think I want to turn to Tammy. You know, menthol cigarettes have been targeting Black communities, as we've discussed already um, from the previous panel members for decades, and even further for Black women. And the results have been just really devastating um, in some of the statistics. What are some of the ways the Black Women's Health Initiative is rallying support to get rid of all flavored tobacco products, and particularly as it relates to Black women's health, of course? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so, you know, we advocate Black Women's Health Imperative for um, the health of Black women, and we've made, you know, our work against tobacco um, use as, as, as a health imperative. Um, and so, for example, in participation in discussions like this, uh, we've also launched a um, program on HBCU campuses called See Us. Um, it's a program that connects students on seven HBCU campuses in a cohort styled work group to address the physical um, and emotional impacts of tobacco use and to develop um, anti-tobacco programming um, to implement on their respective campuses. We are also um, currently um, surveying Black women um, around just to, to talk about to really take a deeper dive into some of their behaviors. Um, you know, are they even aware of some of the things that we're talking about? Um, and we are, we're doing that on college campuses. We're also doing that within the sororities, um, but just black women generally. Um, and then we're also developing fact sheets and information to disseminate within the community. Um, and then also just to um, comment um, on um, Del Monte, what he said, I mean, I think it's very key, uh, you know, to operate on the local level. And so one of the things that we're doing is, you know, really looking at from not only the, you know, not only the local level, getting to the HBCU campuses, talking to Black women, but then also looking at it from a federal level, advocating on Capitol Hill, but then also the courts. Um, and so just being a part of, of looking at um, a, a overall strategic approach and really bringing that and then collaborating with groups, um, many of the groups that are on, they're here on the, um, on the panel, um, you know, helping devise a plan, develop a plan, and then now um, execute that with the community. And I totally agree about, you know, including the community. 
I, you're spot on, Tammy. And, and you mentioned courts and policy in so much of, of your remarks. And I think that is a huge thing that we need to talk about is criminalization, right? And so Dr. Gardner, one of the big tobacco's big lies is they say menthol ban will increase criminalization of Black Americans. We are sure to see this argument in our fights this year. You have had heard this narrative before, I'm sure, but based on your experience, can you explain a few reasons of why this narrative is actually false? Yes, no, and, th and thank you for asking that question. Um, let me just preface it by saying the discussion about fighting on the local level isn't a hypothetical question. Last night in Portland, Maine, they passed a resolution to remove the selling of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace in Portland, Maine. Last night, in San Leandro, California, they removed the menthol exemption that it kept menthol in the market while all flavors are off the market. Um, AATCLC was involved in both those things. So this isn't a theoretical thing. This is going on. This is real. Having said that, the tobacco industry has put out some very vicious lies about what goes on in our community as it relates to menthol. I'm going to touch on three of them. One, the criminalization line, two, it's our cigarette, and three, there, an illicit market will arise. So first, let's deal with the, um, the this is our cigarette. Some people are saying, oh, this is our cigarette. You're being racist by remove, trying to remove menthol. Saying that tobacco advocate, tobacco control advocates are racist stands history on its head. It's the tobacco industry that's been the racist. The targeted marketing, the extra promotions, the cheaper prices, the amount of money that's poured into the community. It's the tobacco industry. These, How these death sticks became our, uh, quote unquote, our cigarettes is that they pushed them down our throats. Secondly, we're hearing the argument, well, it will lead to the criminalization of young black men. Look, all the ordinances that have been passed around the country and even the thing being considered by the FDA says nothing about possession. It says about retail sailing, about wholesale sailing, about um, manufacture. It does not say anything about possession. What the tobacco industry has done in some of their black spokespersons is to conflate um, the, the police violence that is going on in the black community with public health measures like what we're talking about that will actually save lives. Yes, we need to attack, we need to attack what the police are doing in our community. Enough is enough there too. We need to stop having the police killing us that way. But the main killer for the last 60 years of black people has been the tobacco industry. And then lastly, the whole idea um, of an illicit market will arise. Notice I'm not using black market. We should get away from that. Um, an illicit market will arise. Over 75 cities around the country have instituted menthol restrictions. Not one black market has arisen. Canada outlawed menthol cigarettes in 2018. No black market has arisen. The European Union just in 2020 ended menthol. And, and as far as we know, there is no black market arisen. So all of these talking points by the tobacco industry are false. And just because they get black, black spokesmen to say it, we have to stand up against it. It was an excellent question, um, Jennifer, and I appreciate that you asked it. That's an excellent response. And I've just learned so much just in that one minute of your response. I'm busy writing notes. Um, Dr. Gardner, I know you mentioned so much about racial justice and, and how it intersects with criminalization. And so, Gabe, I want to turn it over to you because I know so many different communities that you work with personally are impacted by tobacco use. And in your experience, how are activists themselves organized with the intersection, these really critical intersections that we're talking about of tobacco use, mental health, racial injustice, and LGBTQI plus uh, issues. Can you talk about those intersections a little bit? Yeah, I think more and more every day that folks who live at those intersections of multiple identities are starting to get involved in public health work and just general social justice work, um, which is fantastic uh, because it brings so many more perspectives, stories to the playing field and being able to pass policies and get communities kind of rallied behind these policies. I think something that also kind of comes from that as well is that 
you know, we talk about how, you know, when people are doing well, when people are feeling good, when they have access to, you know, parks and food and all of these things, um, they tend to do better, they tend to feel better, they tend to feel happier, and they tend to not use tobacco products or nicotine products. And so I think we also have to talk about, you know, the impact of mental health and on tobacco use and how, you know, it's been shown multiple times that, you know, the more discrimination that you face as a person, your your higher odds, you have higher odds of using a tobacco product, but then you also have higher odds of using a menthol tobacco product specifically. And so I think we need to talk about how, you know, our public health work and our tobacco control work really needs to be intersectional and it really needs to involve all of those things. Because I think for a very long time, um, you know, that I've been involved in tobacco control, I think we've just focused on like, yeah, you know, as long as someone doesn't pick up a cigarette, that's totally fine. And I think, you know, that's a piece of it. But I think a lot of it is also like, how do we, you know, squash down racism? How do we squash down transphobia? How do we make sure people have, you know, clean water, housing, all of these things? Because we know that those play a huge part in whether or not someone is going to use a tobacco product or not. So I think just this huge intersectionality piece has been arising in public health. And I think it's something that we've all need to move towards. Absolutely, Gabe. Diverse voices, really, those intersections are huge and their voices matter in the solutions. And particularly, how can we think about some preventative measures where, you know, you talked about mental health and the stressors that may be actually increasing folks to use tobacco in the first place because of different stressors in their life and their communities. And so, Deidre, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you a little bit to talk about, you know, the fight back, if you will. So we know the FDA menthol ban will take time, as Dr. Gardner uh, said at the initial start of this conversation. This is not an easy fight. It is not a short fight. It is a long fight. Um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So how will the tobacco industry fight back? And how can advocates be prepared for that fight? What should we be doing in the meantime to protect our communities? I mean, um, thank you for that question. I, I think we're seeing how they're fighting back, you know, injecting, number one, injecting confusion and misinformation in their ads, you know, when it comes to their product. Um, um, one that is really, really sinister is the continued um, alliances made with historically Black institutions, whether it be education, civic, community, community and also influencers who share the same phenotypes and skin colors as we do here um, and ensuring that they are, you know, pulling people who, who follow them and really listen to them because they, they do have influence in certain communities and pulling, you know, bringing them on board um, with, you know, whatever resources they have to um, basically um, refute um, science and public health. You know, that's what we're seeing, all injecting confusion into, you know, the policy process. You know, as it was pointed out earlier, like, oh, we're going to put in all these questions and comments to, like, slow things down. So we see um, examples of how they, you know, inject their confusion into everything. And I think the way that we fight back is, you know, public health um, organizations and institutions and, and advocacy institutions we don't necessarily have the deep pockets as tobacco, but what we do have is people. And I think what we do is rely on the evidence-based interventions and information that we have and make sure that we are getting to every corner that we can and, and, and educate people. Even if it means you know, infiltrating in the same way our opponents infiltrate our spaces, infiltrate those areas where those influencers are and educate you know, their followers about what is uh, happening and the truth about things like, like menthol, vaping, you know, we educate people about those realities and raise awareness. I think that's how we do it. Um, good example is working with youth. We have to start younger and younger. Um, the conversation with Alyssa and Gustavo earlier was a good example is, you know, educating the youth because they're the key. They go home and they educate their families and you have to spread um, like uh, wildfire. You know, that's how we have to use our use our advocates. We have to use um, our people. Thank you. You always have good nuggets, Deidre. I always write them down. People, not pockets. So we got people, but we don't have the deep pockets. And I think the influence is key. 
uh, so much of our culture, Black culture, is so influential around the world. And if we can influence people and our music or whatever, celebrity, we can certainly influence them on uh, this issue of tobacco. And the other thing you raise in terms of the confusion, the policy process, which I want to ask Del Monte about in his work at CBHE, uh, I know some of what you do there builds on the capacity and support for policy initiatives with community members who will be directly impacted by these policies. How do you go about this? And how can you speak to the importance of engaging the community before policy is made? Where do we learn to do this? Don't yeah, very, me. very important skill. Make sure that we have that engagement, make sure that we have that buy-in before we come with the policy. Now, how do we do it? But we've heard, we've heard from some of the different speakers here that yes tobacco is a big issue yes menthol is a big issue but we we got other issues in our community it ain't just tobacco unfortunately we got to deal with COVID. we got to deal with housing we got to deal with employment we got to deal with police brutality we got to deal with a lot of things and so what we try and do is build the capacity of these communities to do advocacy work advocacy work first advocacy work first being able to advocate so whether it's a tobacco policy or whether it's a housing policy or or whether it's protesting or whatever against police brutality, you got to have those advocacy skills. And so we try and build capacity. Now, how do you do it? Well, the way we do it, one of the ways we do it is we've got this training. We've got a five part series where we work with different communities and community groups and coalitions. And on our website, on our website right now is a tool that we use. It's called the Health Justice Guide. Now, the, and, and the website, centerforblackhealth.org. Now, this Health Justice Guide, what it does, is it walks through a history of black people of african americans in this country from the time of slavery and how the relationship between africans or african americans now and tobacco and the tobacco industry and how that relationship uh, was built was built on slavery it was built on racism it led to the housing and the discrimination and the environmental justice and the other social justices and the health injustices that we face and so we walk them through that. We walk them through how this process happened and what it is that they can do about it. Now, when we're talking about build capacity, um, they're just at it. We, we, you know, we got the people, we don't have the pockets. What we try and do is we try and bring resources to the table because it does no good to have this information, but then to not have any resources to take action and to do anything with it. So we try and bring resources to the table give the communities resources, help to develop their infrastructure, provide them that support where they need, whether it's social media or, or web development or, or website, whatever it might be uh, that we can do, we try and help to build the capacity and infrastructure so that now we've given you some skills, we've talked to you about this history, this culture, this context, you've got some skills, now what's your plan? We walk them through a plan, a roadmap on what it is that they want to do step by step and we give them that support as best as we can. Again, we don't have the pockets, so more resources are needed, but this is the strategy that we're using, building capacity and developing infrastructure. That's huge. Um, I know building capacity is always a cliche term, but you just broke it down and really like what that really means feasibly and how it can change lives. And I think advocacy work has to come first, as you mentioned. And so I'm going to touch a little bit and kick it over to Dr. Gardner. Uh, we kicked off one of our biggest advocacy campaigns this year in California to vote yes in November to uphold uh, 793, which would prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco, as you know, in California. Can you share why the fight in California is such important work and what folks out there should be doing to support the campaign? Certainly. Um, let me just first give a shout out to the Center for Black Health and Equity. It's something that the um, Black community and Black health actually needs. Um, secondly, California has been the, in the forefront in the fight to um, get rid of tobacco and tobacco industry influence. Um, we have been fighting since the 1980s to change the social norms that has made smoking um, less attractive and people getting away from it. So the way California goes, the way the nation can go, for example, um, Cal um, San Francisco passed the first in the country menthol restrictions that are citywide. No exemptions, no flavors, no special venues, 
just can't no, no, no. Following that, another 50 cities in California followed suit, and some in Massachusetts began to follow suit. And in fact, that what gave us momentum for the lawsuit that we filed against the FDA. So California has been a trendsetter, um, and we'd like to continue to think that. I, I want to encourage people to join us in the fight against um, big tobacco and, and for getting 793 across the finish line. The impact of the industry cannot be downplayed. This is something that the, the Assembly and the Senate passed in 2020, um, signed by the governor. The Monday after the Friday signing, the tobacco industry began the process of spending $20 million, collecting signatures, and blocking its implementation. We need another, the, the last point I make is that California can slap the tobacco industry and it will go, it will be felt across the country. And I want to encourage people to join us in that slapping, in that fighting, as it were. <laughs> I love that. The slapping, it, it will ensue. And Tammy, we're going to end with you with one question, kind of towards Dr. Gardner's last comment about kind of collective voice in this issue. So can you speak about the importance of coalitions and bringing together a more collective voice on tobacco control advocacy? We know we can't compete with the big tobacco money, but like we've said it several times, we've got the people, not the pockets. So any advice on that, Tammy? Yeah, coalition building is, is so important. Um, while we cannot compete um, with the money the tobacco industry um, puts into their advocacy campaigns, we can bring together um, a broad and diverse set of organizations and voices, you know, advocating on our behalf. Uh, we've seen time and time again um, that there is strength in numbers. This approach allows us to aggregate our strategic approach and investments to streamline our efforts to aggressively um, combat um, the industry. And so, again, just sort of reiterate, you know, um, with um, Mr. Gardner and Mr. Jefferson said, I mean, developing a plan, devising a strategy, mobilizing, implementing, um, and definitely including youth. This is all important in terms of building our coalition collectively together um, to combat the tobacco industry. I love that. And our collective voices really will make a difference. And in honor of Black History Month, I always think of the Black Fist. It's all of our collective fists <laughs> together, right? Uh, for one fight. That's right. That's right, Devante. Well, thank you all. We're coming to the end of our panel discussion. I wish I could have this conversation much longer, but I think we really educated our audience tonight about what they can do to participate in this advocacy work and be a part of the fight against big tobacco. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, again, I would like to just wrap up this evening. Uh, the hour always goes so fast. Thank you to our wonderful panel members who have enlightened me and I'm sure all of you in the fight against bit tobacco, which the campaign for tobacco free kids and our partners have spent more than 25 very long years in this relentless advocacy to frankly save lives. Today, we've heard from experts who have been on the front lines of the movement to end the sale of menthol cigarettes and take on big tobacco. There are so many important fights coming up this year at the federal, state, and local levels. We hope that something you have seen or heard encourage you to join the movement as well. We hope you walk away with a better understanding of the intersectionality of tobacco use, social justice issues, impacting racial equity, climate change, mental health, and many other critical areas. Whether it's supporting your city and state to end the all flavor tobacco products or using the FDA to act quickly to save lives, we hope you explore what getting your advocacy into shape really looks like in the year ahead. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids is working around the clock and across the globe to stop the tobacco industry from addicting a whole new generation, but we can't do it without your support. It is now more important than ever. We, along with our partners here today, call out big tobacco and expose their false narrative. We need to mobilize youth across the country to fight back, to show these companies that we won't be fooled any longer and make sure our policymakers don't believe their lies either. Thank you all for your time and support on this really important topic. 
It has been my pleasure and honor to serve and be a part of this conversation with such brilliant minds in the fight against big tobacco. Please see the tobacco.org link in the chat for more information about how you can help out. Good night, everyone. Thank you.